I'm bubbling with questions to ask you, but the, the first one that I want to come back to, you use the word spacecraft. How would, how would they or you know that, that what they saw was actually a spacecraft? Often the person has not actually seen the spacecraft, but often they have. A, a, a number of these cases, uh, when they're floated through the wall of their home, through the window, through the door, again, this, uh, mm -hmm. so many of the details of these experiences make no sense in our kind of what the Newtonian, Cartesian, Western, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. notions of reality, and yet right. the stories are consistently described uh, with, uh, again, the self-critical attitude that the people have. And they may see uh, a typical uh, unidentified flying object, a, a saucer-shaped uh, or cigar-shaped vehicle on the ground of their home. Uh, emanating bright lights, or they may be taken by a small craft up into the sky to a kind of mothership, which they see very mm -hmm. clearly. So, so many of them actually see the UFOs, that, uh, it's, and the insides are mm -hmm. so uniformly described with rounded, curved walls mm -hmm. and complicated instrument panels mm -hmm. that, that it's become clear that it's uh, some kind of craft in the sky, which they mm -hmm. would naturally call a spacecraft. R I think people would naturally draw that inference, but to me it, it's still an inference. Uh, I, I think you might agree. We don't really know exactly what these things are. I mean, fair enough. I mean, you could have, a, uh, as we do have, very uh, I mean, this gets really into the uh, the way of how we know anything, but yes. we, or our use of language. But we call something which is seen in the sky and which seems to be moving from one place to another. We call it a spacecraft. Now, uh, again, this has to do with uh, where our own technology has come to. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be created as a virtual reality and is similar appears similar to what we already know as. Uh, airplane or a certain type of aerospace vehicle, mm -hmm. so we call it a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, if you want to get down mm -hmm. to the very core of the way language structures reality for us, uh, you could even question whether they're spacecraft. It, isn't it the case that you've described in your book uh, cases that were reported, let's say, a hundred years ago, back in the 19th century, of, of people who talked about airships? Well, the, the, the articles there by uh, Jerome Clark, who's been a um, student of the UFO phenomenon for many years, and he went back and looked into the newspaper accounts of the airship craze of the uh, last decade of the, of the uh, 19th century, and many of those vehicles would look kind of like balloons or looked like the technology of the time, but he went further than that. He actually... Uh, did an exhaustive search of all of the photographs he could find and the descriptions, and lo and behold, many of them did appear very much like the current modern-day UFO, but the people of the time did not have in, the, in our culture the technological knowledge to actually see them as what they were. Mm -hmm. So he's concluded that these were probably UFOs not so different from what we're seeing now, but our perceptual yeah. um, development hadn't reached the point where they could be perceived mm -hmm. uh, the way we now uh, can see things in the sky more or less as we at least think they are. Right. And it, again, you're raising the question whether even that's uh, uh, actual or constructed reality. Well, um, well, we could take this in so many different directions. But let's, let's go back further into the past because the, the accounts uh, don't just begin uh, even in the 19th century, do they? Well, again, uh, if you go back into the early times, you know, Ezekiel's wheel, which is now many UFO, do you think that was a UFO or chariot seen uh, uh, in the sky? Or you go back to the fairies that kidnapped people in Ireland and other countries. There is a, a, some similarities, but you're dealing there with oral traditions, and mm -hmm. it's, it's an easy leap of mind to say, well, we've had this going on all through the centuries and mm -hmm. through the millennia even. The problem with that is the methods of knowing then were so different. You, you, you need to compare a phenomenon, you have to use more or less the same investigative method. And our methods now, uh, as well as, of course, our perceptual, our perceptual capabilities are so different. For yes. example, just take the matter of clinical study. The people that were reporting those experiences weren't being studied clinically. Yeah. Now, uh, 
we have a tradition of when somebody's had an unusual experience or something that doesn't fit or mm -hmm. uh, you want to investigate, you talk to that person in great detail, you get other witnesses, what they've seen. So we have a, a, a kind of body of investigative mm -hmm. l tradition now that yes. can document what's going on. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, this appears to have some mm -hmm. distinct features. Uh, mm -hmm. It also appears, now I'm getting more into my own uh, kind of sense of this, that this thing is entering into our reality in, in a more hard-edged way. In other words, that the first case that we have is the Betty and Barney Hill case, this uh, interracial couple that was coming back from their vacation in Montreal, and they saw a craft that uh, uh, emanated this bright light. They actually saw the creatures in the craft. They were confronted by these creatures. They were terrified. Uh, they were taken in. Each reports various experiments that were done on their bodies, skin scrapings, probings. Mm -hmm and the, the accounts compare. And since that time, more and more cases are yeah. being reported. And it appears that the phenomenon is occurring with greater frequency now than mm -hmm. in the past. But again, yeah. we don't know that. There are reasons, if that's so, why it might be so. But mm -hmm. uh, we're still trying to establish how distinct is this from yeah. earlier reports. The Betty and Barney Hill case uh, was made into a motion picture in a very popular book back in the 1960s. Uh, that's right. The, and the movie came out in the, the mid-70s with James Earl Jones playing the uh, black Barney Hill. Yes. Uh, well, you're a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, or a professor of psychiatry at Harvard, to be exact. I, we haven't gone over where your training was. But you mentioned that when you first heard about Bud Hopkins, who was a, 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 an amateur researcher, in, into that phenomenon, you wondered whether he was crazy. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing clinical work yourself. Mm -hmm. How do your colleagues uh, accept this? Well, again, uh, there's no generic response here. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the range is extraordinary. As I have, on the one hand, uh, a very prominent astrophysicist at Harvard who uh, has become a kind of uh, comrade-in-arms colleague about this. And mm -hmm. uh, he's actually going on record saying that he believes that uh, the uh, work of people like Ken Ring and my, who works with a near-death experience yeah, and Ring myself is, in, mm -hmm. in this area will teach us more about the nature of the cosmos than anything scientists will discover in the next 20 years using telescopes to explore yes. the heavens. It goes from on, on that end mm -hmm. uh, all the way to uh, the acting chair of my department who says, I wish John weren't doing this. Mm -hmm. So uh, in between our all kinds of people who array themselves uh, from letters of support from psychiatrists say, I've seen these cases or continue it, this is mm -hmm. good work, uh, to people that think I've gone off some kind of deep end. Mm -hmm. Well, the obvious counter hypothesis would, would seem to me to be sort of a sociological one, that this is a myth in the making, that there, there's, there's a belief system that is somehow being engendered in the subconscious mind within, within the culture itself, perhaps like a new religion or uh, some other s sort of social movement. It, that's really not a counter hypothesis. That's quite consistent with what I'm finding. Mm -hmm. Because increasingly, uh, folklorists like Peter Roycevich, uh, uh, Thomas Bullard, Eddie Bullard, mm -hmm. uh, are looking back now into myth-making yes. and seeing what was the experiential reality that was the kernel of truth in the physical world. It was what did people actually see and experience from which myths came. Yes. We have this notion in the West that a myth is a kind of invented imagination which comes out of the psyche in some way, which is mm -hmm. a, a very kind of culture-centered notion of myth, mm -hmm. uh, culture-centered in terms of that's what our culture would tend to see. Right. But uh, actually, uh, what they're finding is that there may actually have been some kind of visitations or that there are uh, actual physical bases for myth making. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, this may be indeed a myth of religion could evolve from this, yes. but that doesn't go against the fact that something physical, something actual is occurring in our uh, material universe. Mm -hmm.